So the Knicks coming off a, a big win against the Mavs last night in which R.J. Barrett continued his hot play. Uh, they get another Duke Blue Devil uh, in New York. Um, today, traded with the Hawks to acquire 22-year-old Cam Reddish. Um, and that looks like a, a, a pretty significant acquisition for uh, the New York Knicks. So again, Michael, we talk so much about um, the number one pick uh, in that draft a couple of years ago, Zion Williamson talk a lot about John ja Morant. The number three pick is coming on strong. Uh, RJ Barrett is uh, for the New York Knicks, and now they get his old teammate uh, Cam Reddish from Atlanta. Tom Haberstroh, uh, grade that trade for us, man. I mean, you see, you seem to like it for big picture reasons based on your tweet a little while ago. But just grade, uh, grade that trade uh, from both teams' perspective. I'm also curious as to what Atlanta is up to here. Yeah, to me, this is all about Zion and speaking it into existence. Of course, RJ Barrett, Cam Reddish, and Zion Williamson played together at Duke a few years ago. And if you remember, you know, this recruiting class that Duke got, number one was RJ Barrett, number two was Cam Reddish, and number three was Zion coming into that, that program. So keep in mind of the kind of ceiling we're talking about with Cam Reddish and, and the player that they're acquiring and the backstory of them, of course, playing together at Duke. Look, I think that's what this deal is about, is not just acquiring a player who's a good spacer, who's vastly improved over this past season in Cam Reddish, who can do a couple things offensively and can give you something defensively. That's not what this is about. This is about appealing to that guy in New Orleans who isn't on the floor and still not going to be on the floor for quite some time and seeing if they can speak that into existence. It reminded me of when the Lakers had LeBron and Rich Paul became the agent for Anthony Davis. And I just sat there being like, mm. nah, like that, that's not going to happen. They're not actually going to be able to acquire Anthony Davis from New Orleans. And that's exactly what happened. So I'm not saying that this is going to happen, that Zion's going to New York, but remember how the stars aligned for LeBron James and Lakerland and Rich Paul in the same way that for the Knicks, I think that they're betting that this is going to make someone very happy. And that audience is of one. It's Zion. I, I love it. It's fascinating. And, and I wonder if, if the Knicks view Zion the same way they did, let's say this time last year because of his injuries, it, it, you know, I, I think a, a lot of us looked at it and we wouldn't even allow ourselves to say John ja Morant should have been number one and Zion too. We're having those kind of conversations or those kind of thoughts now, but do the Knicks still look at and do people in the league still look at Zion as that guy who, hey, you make a trade because it's a piece in bringing him there uh, eventually. Well, look, if there's one thing that coaches love, it's a reclamation project. There is not a coach or a GM in this league that doesn't think that they can fix Zion Williamson, that they can get him into shape, that if they just change his scenery away from New Orleans and the Big Easy and, and, and Bourbon Street, that maybe we can get Zion Williamson to stay in shape and to really give it his all in a different scenario, surround him with his college teammates, surround him with a different scenario maybe that will snap him back into shape, quite literally, pun intended. So um, I do think that GMs around the league notice that he hasn't been on the floor and that he has put on some weight. He hasn't been in game shape. But, man, it is a tale as old as time in the NBA is believing that you can change a, a player or a reclamation project. That has always happened in the league. So while Zion Williamson has been injury riddled in his NBA career, I still think people see the guy who is shooting 65% from the floor and averaging over 20 points a game when he was healthy and still not looking any like he did at Duke where he was slim and he was cut and he was just killing people. I do think that his stock around the league is still high, even if it isn't nearly as high as it was on draft night. I mean, listen, we've covered Zion. We've covered RJ Barrett. We've covered Cam Reddish. We might as well stay with this 2019 NBA draft theme and talk about John Morant's Memphis Grizzlies. Uh, Michael and I can't get enough of them. Uh, they're the most must-see team in the league right now with apologies to, you know, the Warriors or Nets. Uh, they take, tonight's going to be a, a great game. Like, a lot of people talking about Warriors, Bucks. Uh, I, like, Timberwolves, Grizzlies, is, I mean, Anthony Edwards, Zion, wait, uh, excuse me, John Morant. Like, I'm, I'm psyched for that game. Uh, both Michael and I have put Memphis in the contender category in the Western Conference, right up there with Golden State and Phoenix. How far do you see... Uh, Memphis going come playoff time, given what they've done so far in the regular season with and without John Morant. 
Yeah, I'm not there yet, guys. I'm not there yet. I've I've loved what I've seen from John Morant, but he needs another star on his team to get him into that next tier. Look, we've seen it with with Chicago with Derrick Rose, where they ran the table there in that 2011 season. And he got MVP, and an you know, he call. ran into the machine of of the Miami Heat, the big three in the Miami, and then they just it, they they couldn't compete at that level. Like, who is the number two on that Memphis Grizzlies team? You know, Jaron Jackson Jr. Um, Dylan Brooks. I mean, they're going to have to find someone who is like, you know, in Chicago is like, is it Carlos Boozer? Is Carlos Boozer enough right. to scare the Miami Heat in 2011? And that's my thing with with Memphis is as well as John Moran has been, he still needs that co-pilot to me to take that next level into that contender category. Because I just think Golden State, Phoenix, Milwaukee, Brooklyn, when it comes playoff time, Z I mean, uh, John Moran cannot do it by himself. I love I, I, so, I, I love hate the, the, the roles comparison. That's that's pretty apt. Go ahead, Michael. Sorry. No, I was gonna say, you know, you mentioned Golden State. Do you look at it now with the return of Clay? Do you think, okay, game over? They did well without him. Now that he's coming back, working him, working uh, his way back into uh, the rotation and back into shape and getting to his rhythm, you just feel like a hey, Golden State and everybody else in the West. Man, Clay looks great defensively getting after it um, offensively when he dunked it was it was a revelation it was just like it, it, it wasn't even on my radar that he could do that period that he could dunk period and then to do it with that kind of force and that kind of energy it was it was beyond like the stats almost didn't matter I needed to see that and I needed to see him taking on those defensive assignments because those were the two biggest question marks I had not about fit and chemistry like that's fine like his shot I'm not worried about that the two things that I was concerned about was his lift and his ability to move laterally and stay in front of those star players on the other side. And to me, that's the biggest thing about Klay Thompson's return is his ability to not just leap, but dunk and take on those defensive assignments because they're going to need it. They're going to need all the help they can get on that end of the floor. Gary Payton, the second has been fantastic. Another revelation for that team. Uh, but to me, Clay Thompson's addition and his mobility and his confidence, all of that tells me that the Warriors are on another plane. They're on another level despite Steph Curry's slump right now. I know what they can do with Clay Thompson, Draymond Green, and Steph Curry win 73 games. And I really like the complimentary players on this team. I still think they think they're a tier above everybody else. What does uh, Dame Lillard having uh, abdominal surgery? And by the time he gets back, I mean, the Blazers, what, 16 and 24 right now? By the time he gets back, it's hard to imagine that they would still be, uh, you know, in the mix. It might, be, like, might not even look the same come to the trade deadline, but it's hard to imagine they'd be in the mix for even a play-in spot by the time he gets back. So let's say his season's done. Uh, what, what's the domino effect of Damian Lillard having uh, abdominal surgery? That's pretty good, Mike. That's impressive. Um, I, 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 I got to say, <laughs> <laughs> the dad jokes, I, I do not have to teach you about those. Um, so when you when you look at this situation, I can't project until they get a general manager there. Who is going to be steering that ship? Is that going to be a, a person that Damian Lillard trusts to, to restart the engines and to retool that organization in a championship form? To me, this just kicks the can down the road to that inevitable conversation that is going to have to be had, that tough conversation that Damian Lillard is going to have to have with his front office about the future of this franchise, not about this year. It's always about what are the next two, three years? What is that going to look like? Because he's not getting any younger. And I know that's true for everybody on this planet, including you and me. But when we talk about Damian Lillard, it is all about this offseason and, and seeing a vision about what this looks like going forward. Because, look, Anthony Simons, great, great job the other night against the Nets. Um, you know, Nasir Little, like, this is great this young nucleus that is forming there in Portland, but that's not going to get it done. That's not going to get them in, in, in the conversation of the contender pile. So to me, this injury just kicks the can down the road even more to this summer when things, the fireworks might get even might get even bigger because we might get finally some clarity on the Ben Simmons situation. You know what, Stro? man, I, I, I missed an opportunity. I should have asked you this right out right uh, in, in conjunction with my Clay Thompson Golden State question, because Michael Smith and I had this debate at the end of the show yesterday. I'm not going to tell you what side he's on, what side I'm on, but I don't know if you saw. Uh, Steph oh, Curry oh. said he had. He got a question. Hey, how would you guys <laughs> do against the '96 Bulls? Jordan, Pippen, Rodman. 
And, you know, Steph said, you know, he was polite, but he said, dubs in six. Now, I got to say, the dubs with Kevin Durant and Steph and Clay and Draymond and Iguodala, that's the best team I've seen in my lifetime. So I said they, w well, I already gave them. I said they win. Michael Smith says, no way. Bulls in four. Bulls in five. Bulls five, in three. Five. Gentlemen, see. <laughs> what do you wait, think? Wait, wait, you with, think with, KD, with KD? With KD? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. That, that's Warriors. Warriors in six. I'm with Steph on that one. Like, I, I don't think people understand um, how the, the three-point shot would be totally alien to everything the Bulls had seen that season. And I know it's hard with these time travel things, but like Steph Curry is an alien to today's coaches. Today's coaches don't know what to do with Steph Curry. Now imagine him in 1995, 96 on those defenses that are still packing the paint and wondering what to do with Kevin Durant and Steph Curry and Klay Thompson. Like I think the three ball is so much bigger advantage than say Jordan versus KD or Jordan versus Steph. I think that's a, a gap. They would figure Michael it out. Jordan's <laughs> they would adjust. No, no, hey, they would hey, you figure know what, it out. It's not an hey, it's not in <laughs> Exactly. Hey, Stroke, I was trying to give him I tried no, to give him an out you yesterday. Cheated. I said you cheated. I said no. I said what this era do cheating. you want? I said are we I said are we going back to are we playing uh, the Bulls era? Are we in the modern this is era? Cheating. He said it doesn't matter. Michael, I tried to give Michael, him. Michael, this I tried is to cheating. Give him out. You you knew where Stroh was gonna go. You knew I, I was having know. an emotional conversation, and then you bring in Stroh, who you know gonna draw knowledge and facts and whatnot. This ain't about facts. It's about feelings. Okay, it's about feelings. Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Dennis Rodman, and Tony Kukoc, Bulls in five. Okay, I don't care about your facts, Stroh. Okay, we're not here to be smart. We're here to be emotional and irrational, okay? <laughs> Just understand what show you're on right now. <laughs> they would adjust you know, someone, and figure it out. Bill Jackson would figure it out somehow. <laughs> you know, someone, yeah, like they figured out that magic team with Shaq, right? Um, so anyway, uh, when we're talking about this team, someone hit me up on Twitter, like, how is, how, who's going to guard Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen? And I'm like, yo, do we not see Andre Iguodala win a finals MVP by playing defense against LeBron James? Like the dude is so much bigger than Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan. He was still able to win a finals MVP playing defense against LeBron. So not only that, um, I just think it's, it's, it's a total loophole. It's a total loophole. This whole three point shot. Like they wouldn't yeah. even know what to do with Steph. Like no one comes even close to that he is so alien to today's coaches <sighs> back then man That's right it's like it's like yeah. us thinking that aliens down, look like what right. we think they do but no aliens are a totally like nah man if aliens are still on this if aliens are out here they ain't trying Definitely. to be seen they ain't trying to yeah. be seen we are making our own yeah. like human projection what we think an alien is that's what step is so it's really strong up, but, but, deep but, down in places but, i don't but, talk about but, it, but, parties, i know you're right I know you're right. Yeah. Deep down. Yeah, people. but Ron Harper, but Ron Harper would lock down Steph. <laughs> yeah, ain't nobody Harper. said that. See, ain't nobody said that. Ain't nobody said that. I'll just take, I'll take my chances <laughs> with the two greatest perimeter <laughs> defenders of all time. Oh, Thank my you goodness. very much with apologies to the glove. Apologies to Gary Payton. Dennis Rodman will get in their heads. All those intangibles, Stro. We're talking about intangibles, intangibles. here. <laughs> yeah, I just want to hear where this Brooklyn Nets team, what they would be like against, uh, what was it, the, the 96 Bulls we're talking? Yeah, it, yeah. I'm done with them. I'm done. Hey, thanks for watching Brother from Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern time on Peacock. Appreciate you.